So how many musicians does it take to write a hit song? Well, for today's hit song, let's say it's quite a few. Thanks to a heavy-handed, sonically obsessive frontman, this group endured more than one mutiny in its time, including five furious bandmates who quit right on the spot. I mean, it's a wonder then that this band managed to get even one hit song. But in the U.S., it's actually all it got. Turning in one of the catchiest, off-the-beaten-track number one hits of the 80s, somehow this revolving crew of musicians made their mark on music history. It's a story you're not going to want to miss. Very entertaining. Coming up next on Professor of Rock. Hey, music junkies. Professor of Rock, always here to celebrate the greatest artists and the greatest songs of all time. You know, if you know every word of Bohemian Rhapsody or any other of these classic songs, you know what they mean, you're going to dig this channel. Make sure that you subscribe below right now. Daily Time Machine, the 60s, 70s, 80s, and 90s, all the time. Uh, also, check us out on Patreon for even more content. So it's time for another edition of our series, Bottle Lightning. This is where we celebrate a song or an album that was king for a day, or many days. Here we honor artists and bands and those songs that rocketed up the charts, but for reasons unknown, they weren't able to sustain that success, called by some uh, as one-hit wonders. We celebrate them instead as lightning in a bottle. Today, we're heading back to 1982 to take a closer look at Dexy's Midnight Runner's number one hit, Come On Eileen. Actually, it peaked in 83, but it was conceived by vocalist and guitarist Kevin Rowland. Dexy's Midnight Runners were one of the most original and eclectic UK bands to break out in the 80s. At this moment, you Kevin Rowland, along with rhythm guitarist Al Archer, were previously members of punk outfit The Killjoys before forming Dexy's in 1978. Adding several other members to this lineup, the initial grouping was actually like a miniature orchestra featuring musicians on bass, drums, Piano, tenor sax, alto sax, trumpet, and trombone. The band took their name from the amphetamine dexedrine, which uh, Northern Soul fans commonly use as a recreational drug. Roland, the undisputable band leader, fashioned the band's image straight out of the 1973 Robert De Niro movie Mean Streets. They will pay their debt tonight in Mean Streets. The result was a, a chic New York Italian docker ensemble. Dexy's Midnight Runner scored a top 40 UK hit right off the bat with their November 1979 debut single, Dance Dance. But it was their major label follow of Gino that really broke them in the UK, going all the way to number one in May of 1980. However, only months after the release of their debut album, Searching for the Young Soul Rebels, Kevin Rowland was facing a mutiny. Their speedy chart success notwithstanding, Roland's supporting cast was really put off by his Iron Fist leadership style. And in November 1980, five members defected to form a new band they called The Bureau. Uh, then the following January, Dexy co-founder Kevin Al Archer, he jumped ship as well, forming the Blue Ox Babes. With only one bandmate left, Roland had to swallow his pride and beg trombonist Big Jim Patterson to stick around. Said Patterson, the end of the first Dexys was such a miserable event. The band had had enough of Kevin being a tyrant. But he came to my flat and he said, I need you, Jim. I was actually ready to join the Bureau, but Kevin said he couldn't do it without me, end of quote. Uh, fuming at his former bandmates, Roland was determined to be more successful than ever. In his words, it was only the motivation of wanting to do them down that made me carry on. I'm going to form another Dexys Midnight Runners, and I'm going to beat those bastards. However, after enlisting replacements, Roland would struggle to keep that new lineup in place. In fact, just a side note, there have been more than 50 musicians associated with Dexys Midnight Runners since its inception. And during that time, there's been only one constant member, Kevin Roland. Well, by 1982, Roland was envisioning a radical new sound for the band. Yeah, it would feature the incorporation of fiddles. Dexys would be something of a, a Celtic gospel mashup, a fusion of Northern soul and uh, traditional Irish music. Once again, Roland and Patterson set to work putting together a new lineup. 
this time comprising a new string section called the Emerald Express. Uh, this featured musicians uh, Helen O'Hara, Steve Brennan, and Roger McDuff. New guitarist Kevin Billy Adams, he was also added. Rounding things out, there was also Seb Shelton on drums, there was Mickey Billingham on keyboards, Paul Spear was on tenor saxophone, uh, Brian Maurice on alto saxophone, and Giorgio Kilkenny, and then Steve Wynn both on bass. But new faces weren't the only change in look for this band. Out was the Mean Street's New York longshoreman style, and in came the unkept appearance of dirty dungarees, leather jackets, and neckerchiefs. This new vagabond styling it definitely made for a striking and memorable visual. When it came time to record Dexy's second album, To Rai A, uh, the band was joined by producers Clive Langer and Alan Wynn Stanley at uh, Genetic Studios in Berkshire. And apparently the two producers were stumped by how tightly rehearsed this band was. Roland, in producer-like fashion, had already whipped the album into shape. All that was really left to do was to record and to mix. However, when Roland heard the album's final mix, he hated it. It was not at all how it sounded in his head, so he asked their label Mercury Records if they could just remix it. But he was told that there was neither time nor money to do this. And since everyone else, you know, the band, the management, and the label, they all thought it sounded just fine, no changes were made. This really bothered Kevin Roland for years. And uh, anytime he would talk about Tu Rye after that, he would describe it as a soulless, flawed artifact. But regardless of Roland's misgivings, Tu Rye went on to become the band's most successful album by far. Released on July 22, 1982, it debuted at number two on the UK Albums Chart. It spawned multiple UK singles, starting with Plan B, that went to number 58, Show Me, that reached number 16, Liars A to E, that filled the chart, and the Celtic Soul Brothers, that topped out at number 45. But up to this point, Dexy's Midnight Runners were still an unknown in the United States. However, their next single, Come On Eileen, it would change all of that very quickly. And it would become, at least for Americans, one of the greatest bottle lightning songs of all time. As we break down this classic, I want to thank our sponsor, Zenny Eyewear, the glasses that I wear every single day. Zenny is so quality, especially for the price point. You can design multiple pairs of glasses, even a different pair for every day of the week, and not break the bank. They start at just $6.95, and you can have them delivered right to your door. Check it out at zenny.com today. So come on, Eileen. That was written by Kevin Rowland, uh, Big Jim Patterson, Billy Adams, and really, in a way, former Dexys guitarist Al Archer. Now, I mention Archer even though he was no longer in the band because there's some controversy about the song's authorship. Now, when Archer left the band, he left behind a demo tape that featured his future Blue Ox Babe song, What Does Anybody Ever Think About? As it turns out, What Does Anybody Ever Think About and Come on Eileen have some distinct similarities, particularly the, the slowing down and speeding up part. Now, when Archer heard Come on Eileen, the similarities, they weren't lost on him. He said, it was my music. There was no mistaking it. To be fair, he wrote the words in the music, but it was the tune that was so distinctive and made it a success that that tune was mine. Roland admitted to technically stealing Come on Eileen from Archer, though later on he would clarify his admission, saying that at the time he was just punishing himself. He said, I was in a dark place and thought it had all been him and I had no talent. What actually happened was he played me his demos and he was using a combination of a Tamla style beat with violins, which I thought sounded better than what we were doing. 
So I nicked that style and the idea of speeding up and slowing down, but I didn't steal one note, not one chord, not one melody. The writing process wouldn't be any less drama filled. Roland was obsessive in his attempts to perfect this song. He drove Patterson and sax player Brian Marie's mad. <laughs> totally mad in the process. They began by working out the chord structure. And from there, Kevin tried various melodies over the top of it. Roland would then think of a key that he wanted the song to be in and get the band to play it over and over again. And then he would think of another key and have them do it in that one over and over again. Then when Kevin asked the band to sing the main refrain, Maurice kept singing it differently from Kevin's uh, instructions. No, 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 said Kevin, you're singing it wrong. I know what it is, shot back Maurice. I just don't like it. Furious Roland told him to hit the road. And when he did, an exasperated Jim Patterson, he followed suit. The two of them then formed TKO Horns, and uh, Roland would later hire them back as session players. So in describing the song's signature catchy sound, Kevin Roland would say, we wanted a good rhythm, and we found one. Lots of records we liked had that rhythm. You know, there's Concrete and Clay, It's Not Unusual by Tom Jones. Lots of records we liked had that. What you Roland also said that it was him who actually came up with a memorable Irish-inspired phrasing, to Ralura. And after he did, he thought, wow, this is sounding really good. And he knew that he was onto something. So what is Cohen Eileen actually about? Well, there seems to be two converging themes here. On one level, the song speaks to uh, breaking free from a dead-end life and you know, shaking off the expectations of prior generations. You get a sense of this as the song references poor old Johnny Ray, sounding sad on the radio. If you could ride. Roland's, of course, name-checking the uh, 50s crooner to underscore the sorrow that hangs over the scene that he longs to escape. In the following verse, Roland lays it out even clear, more clearly. These people around here wear beat down eyes, sunken, smoke dried face. So resign to what their fate is. But for him and Eileen, things are gonna be different. He promises her a better future, saying that that won't be them, because after all, they're far too young and clever. One of my favorite lines. The other prominent theme that comes into play has to do with coming to terms with one's sexual desires. Hey, you got, got to talk about it. That's what the song's about. Said Kevin Rowland about it. For years, I told everyone that Eileen was my childhood girlfriend. In fact, she was a composite to make a point about Catholic repression. Now, Rowland was raised Catholic and he served as an altar boy in church. As a teenager, he was surrounded by Irish Catholic girls for whom he felt an overpowering attraction. But he was told that he wasn't supposed to have those feelings. Sex was not only a taboo subject, but it was considered very dirty. Hence the lines, you in that dress, my thoughts I confess, verge on dirty. I love how he says that. Billy Joel covered a, a similar theme in Only the Good Die Young. But Come On Eileen interweaves these two themes into a message of breaking free from the status quo. But in the end, you know, maybe uh, nothing sums up Roland's argument as well as his impassioned cry of independence. Tu ra lu ra, tu ra lu ra -e. One of the big reasons for Eileen's success in the United States was thanks to uh, the song's music video, really. Got constant airplay on MTV, directed by Julian Temple. The clip was filmed in the inner south London suburb of Kennington. In this unconventional love story, an overall clad uh, Roland sings and dances a jig on a street corner while his band backs him up. 
Repeatedly, he just pursues Eileen. A character who is played by Maura Fahey, sister of Chauvin Fahey of Bananarama fame. In the end, the two walk off together, arms around one another. The video was a bold move at the time, since New Wave was revving up on MTV. But with the passage of time, Come and Eileen definitely became a, a defining image from uh, that year, that era. Come and Eileen was, of course, an enormous hit. It was the biggest selling single of 1982 in the UK. It reached number one there. It wouldn't be released in the US until 83, like I said, but in April of that year, it also went to number one on the Billboard Hot 100. It actually knocked Michael Jackson's Billie Jean uh, from the perch, uh, top perch in the process. It actually pulled off a major upset by stopping MJ from having back-to-back -back number one hits. Uh, he would have followed in the Beatles' footsteps. Billie Jean had been number one during the previous seven weeks, and then Beat It would reach number one after Eileen giving Jackson a, another three weeks on top. I mean, let's be honest, only a song of this caliber could upset the apple card at the time of Michael Jackson Thriller and his, his two big records, his two big hits from, from that album. I've heard from those in the know, actually, that Michael Jackson detested Come On Eileen. As Roland later said, not bad for a song that nearly split up the band, sent me to the verge of mania, and then almost wasn't even released. I always knew it was a good one. Outside the US and UK, Come and Eileen dominated as well. It reached number nine in Austria, number six in Germany, number five in France, number four in the Netherlands, number two in Canada. And it went to number one in Switzerland, Australia, Ireland, New Zealand, South Africa, and Belgium. Now, since then, Come On Eileen has appeared in a long list of movies and TV shows, as you can imagine. At this moment, you mean everything. It was in Tommy Boy in 95, that 80s show in 2002, Psych in 2008, Parenthood in 2010, Get Him to the Greek, Take Me Home Tonight, Perks of Being a Wallflower, all in 2011 and 2012. One Chance, Jane the Virgin, the Looming Tower, High Fidelity, uh, the new one, and Wakefield. Oh, Scott. Come on, Eileen has also been covered by a lot of bands, save Ferris in 97. Come on, Eileen. Oh, I swear what he means. Garth Brooks did it in 98. SR 71 did it in 2000. Jimmy Fallon in 2001. Howie Day did it in 2004. Sarah Bareilles and Sugarland just did it. Vega, Neon Trees, and actually, Cyndi Lauper's Girls Just Wanna Have Fun borrowed from the rhythm of the song. <laughs> Come and Eileen was popular in the US while Lauper was recording her debut, She's So Unusual, and Cyndi and her producer were struggling to find uh, that right rhythm for Girls Just Wanna Have Fun, until they heard the Dexys hit. Then it just clicked. After the release of Tu Rye, Dexy's Midnight Runners toured extensively, tweaking their name to Kevin Rowland and Dexy's Midnight Runners. They also re released the Celtic Soul Brothers in the US as a second single, though it stalled at number 86 on the Hot 100. Dexy's would continue to churn out singles in the UK up through the mid 80s. But come on, Aileen, that would be the band's solitary US hit, making them a bottle lightning standard. After the 1985 record, Don't Stand Me Down, uh, that filled the chart stateside, Dexys disbanded, and uh, Roland would pursue a solo career. Roland later reformed the band in 2003 with a mix of new and old members. They then released a Greatest Hits album. Two other studio albums followed in 2012 and 2016, but uh, neither scored any chart action. Decades after the success of Common Eileen, there was still one thing that was nagging at Kevin Roland. Yeah. 
He was still unhappy with the mix to Raye. Even after four decades, he couldn't let it go. In fact, in all that time, he wouldn't even listen to it. Said Roland, when people enthuse about Tu Raye, I'm wincing inside because I never felt worthy of that big success. However, all that changed in 2020. Confined to his flat during COVID-19, Roland tuned into a Tim Burgess Twitter listening party for Tu Raye. Bandmate Kevin Archer listened as well. Afterwards, Roland and Archer chatted about the album. And Roland felt like it was finally time to do something about his frustrations. Collaborating with Helen O'Hara, the pair took notes on Roland's vision for a remixed version and turned them over to producer Pete Schwier. After it was all done, Kevin said that he was dancing around the room. He was in tears, is what O'Hara said. He was so happy. Said Roland, I was tearful because I felt so proud of it, something that had never happened before. It had taken four decades, but finally, Tu Raye matched the music he had been hearing in his head all along. And Eileen, for her part, got to tune up as well. Come on, Eileen was one of my favorite songs of that year in 1983. It's just a little kid. I remember the first time I heard it on the American Top 40 Countdown with Casey Kasem, and I was quick to record it off the radio. I was really fast. I always had my tape ready. Uh, it was just a few seconds in. I knew it was going to be good. I rooted for it as it climbed up the charts, and I freaked out when it hit number one, even though my sister was livid when it knocked Michael out of number one. I think my little brother actually was so upset he cried. Michael Jackson Thriller was popular back then. I played it all the time. It's as joyful of a pop song as there has ever been. For anyone that grew up in the 80s, a true 80s kid, it's one of our all-time mantras, to Raye. Well, leave us a comment about Dexy's Midnight Runners and Come On Eileen. What do you remember about this number one hit? Do you remember the first time you heard it? Uh, you know, what are your memories of it? Let us know in the comments below. Let's have a fun discussion about this. Such a great song. What do you love most about the song? What are your favorite lyrics? Uh, and make sure to subscribe if you like this video. Share with friends. The idea here is always to keep the music alive. We're celebrating the greatest music of all time, in my opinion, the rock and roll era. The 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, 90s. Ah, love it. Until next time, three chords. And the truth, my friends. Talk to you soon.